The question is, is these are the kind of discussions that I believe are going on in the business. You know, I need impact, I need ROI, I got no budget. Um, you know, but since 2008, all this recognized at the times that really, as Bob Dillon once said, aren't changing. One thing you know, everybody wants a deal, right? Uh, incentives, incentive marketing has been around for well over 100 years. And the question you should ask yourself, I want you to ask yourself, did you guys wake up today and say, I'm going to buy something and I'm going to pay full price for it? Anybody in this room do that? No, I got you did. Well, I, got, I got a card from a psychiatrist friend of mine. Post it. <laughs> yeah. You know, a psychiatrist friend of mine told me to give out his cards. If anybody is uh, that doesn't want a deal, then uh, they, they're not living in the same universe with the rest of us. The fact is, is that the world has changed. You need proof of that change. Time magazine did an article on your new reality: how consumers and businesses have changed. Incentives are the way of the world and customers have changed in their brutality probably forever. No way, no, no less than the Wall Street Journal does a lot of articles. This is about extreme couponing. So the business and the business environment has changed. Customers and consumers want, demand, and expect incentives to drive them to purchase behavior. So today I want to talk a little bit about the changes in consumer behavior and some incentive techniques that many of you may use. My abiding sense is not everyone is using them in the correct way and maybe I can give you some insights with my 30 years of doing this to, uh, to help you do it better. Okay, I've worked on a ton of brands from, from my days at LNF products, maybe the Lysol household cleaning products, now Reckon Benkeiser, to uh, my days at Bristol Myers, where I worked on Comfort, Pan, Yoder, and Buffer, and et cetera, and all those consumer brands. And then at Velasquez, where I was the executive sponsor of both McDonald's and Burger King, I spent a lot of time with both those organizations as well as with Kroger and PG in Cincinnati. Kroger, prior to coming in and managing the Fruit and Chocolate program, I used to do an awful lot of work in Cincinnati with both Kroger, as well as many other package based manufacturers. Best B2C marketers in the world. Hopefully, we can take, we can take some insights away from them. Um, first thing, the concept, as Beth knows, Beth has seen this, Beth likes to be working in the marketing group of Velasquez, and she's seen this once or twice. I'm a pretty simple guy. And since there's not a lot of categories and a lot of businesses that are experiencing a geometric growth in demand quotient, generally speaking, your business looks like that. It's a leaky bucket, guys. And so at the end of 2011, you had X amount of volume and level in your bucket. And that volume was predicated on number of users, usage occasions, times your price. And if you did well in 2011, life is good. But this is 2012. So as you move into 2012, the bucket is leaking. Your competitors are trying to suck those users and usage occasions out of your bucket with price tactics, with any promotion techniques they're doing, with their advertising, with their new products. In addition to the economy, uh, the leaky bucket is probably fairly prevalent. So in order for you to be successful, you need to put people in. And what you need to, what you, what you need to do is bring new buyers into the franchise, Lapsed users, people tried to get rejected, you had gone elsewhere, bring them back in, create incremental usage. In the package goods world, it's pretty easy. You got somebody buying 12 ounce Cokes, you have them buy 24 ounce Cokes, that's incrementality. But you guys' challenge is to bring new buyers in and to get more out of your existing customer base. So, how do you grow your bucket? The economy we live in. The world has changed in 2008. It will never change again. Your customers and your consumers, if you're a consumer business, have been dramatically altered by the economy. So there's some terrific ideas and terrific impact and promotions that have done in the marketplace. But I want to talk today about how people are using new financial incentives to drive businesses. Now, most of you guys are B2B businesses, your business to business. So it's a new manifestation for business to business business. But 
I can look at some of the BBC work that's been done in the marketplace for over 100 years and give you some insights as to how you might use incentives better. First question you've got to ask yourself, do buying segments exist? And the answer is yes. They exist very, very prominently in your, in your business. This was a study done by a company called Knowledge Networks of Promotion Decisions. They used 33,000 consumers. They follow them over an 18-month period in grocery using frequent chopper cart, which is the best behavioral microscope you got to show so people show you actually what they do with their money as opposed to what they tell you in a survey. If you're a research wonk, 99.9% confidence levels, less than one, less than 0.1 significance. This is this is good stuff. Now it's consumer-based, but what they found as they started it, they found that there were new buyers. They found that there were people that were existing on these 10 categories, 12 brands and 12 categories they looked at, they followed them for 18 months. And what they found was interesting. One, over 55% of the people use no incentive statistically doesn't influence their behavior. So they found that, you know, in the book, that these people use incentives, but it doesn't statistically alter their behavior. A quarter of them, coupons statistically influence their behavior. About 20% of them, price influences their behavior. And in this particular study, 2% was the lunatic fringe. Those are the people you saw in the Wall Street Journal article. I gotta tell you, that group was small when the study was done. Today, I guarantee you that group was very, very substantial. What's the point? Well, these guys exist in the business. Now, the percentages are gonna be vastly different in a B2B environment, but they exist. And you need to recognize that. The next concept I'd like to talk about is why you do promotions. And this is, I told, told Bud, uh, the, uh, the academic police don't, uh, don't, uh, don't report me. I listed this from the study. Very difficult to find a promotion response model. This is what I did. I looked it from the study and I kind of adapted it for my needs. What you'll see there is the dotted line. That is your base sales. Everybody has a volume of sales that's in the marketplace. When you introduce a promotion at the bottom, you'll see a trough. It could be a big drop, it could be a little drop. It's what promotion does. And what you want to see in a classic promotion response model is your sales level off higher than it went in. Why? Because you brought people into your bucket. Either new users, lapse users, incremental usage. So what you want to see is that, is that, is that sales line go up after the promotion. You'll notice in this one, the line stretches out, the sales line stretches out. And that's really a good point for you guys to consider. Promotion is short term. You always want to look at, evaluate, and talk about promotion in a short term manner. The way you the way you calculate an ROI here is you look at your sales, what your sales were going in, calculate the amount of sales over that line in the, in the bump, and one purchase cycle, like two, three months, that's your incremental volume, divided by your cost, that's your ROI. Okay? But you always want to look at promotion in a short term manner. Okay? There's a couple types of incentives. Everybody uses. First is price ups, right? Everybody sees the grocery circulars. You may use some, some, some store circulars for your business, some discounts, etc. I, I view these as passive. But and why would I think they're passive? You can, how many guys walk in a store and you don't know there's a sale on an item you're going to buy and there's a discount on it? Okay, you're not actively seeking. There is some, some degree of activity that people will look at the circulars and buy buy an item they wouldn't buy. But the problem is, financial liability 100%. Everybody that walks in the door gets the price, whether that incentive drove them in the door or not. So that becomes a real issue for you guys in small businesses as you think about it. As you think about it. it rewards current users, but there's some incrementality that occurs. However, very, very different for you and small business owners to figure out where is that incrementality coming from. So this is a good tactic, it's used a lot, but I would, I would be careful. It's immediate gratification. <coughs> when you look at that short term, my experience says that 30 to 40 percent short term on the market is spending about 30 to 40 percent back in the short term. Okay. Is that good for you? Um, second type of incentives is cash rebates, right? This is an active incentive. A lot of people got to grab it, they got to do something with it, they got to find it. It's more active. Well, the problem is, you know, low liability, right? 
Why? Because it's going to get a mail back response rate is generally less than 1%. So why do you use an incentive? There's no means. <coughs> You know, there are things like immediate gratification. No, I mean, listen, it rewards potential users, but when you have a high value purchase, like some of the items up here, it's that type of high, high, high value, low purchase incidence. People are going to purchase an item once a year, a rebate gives you that tiebreaker, so you get that purchase into your bucket versus the competition. It's like you can do but you are alive. Okay. Loyalty cards. How many of you guys have a loyalty card? <laughs> Two people usually will show they'll, they'll, they'll raise their keychain on three, four, five cards on the on their on their, their keychain. Three, five is typical what people have. So why would you use a loyalty? Well, it's both passive and active. Anybody walk in a grocery store, we have a Kroger card or something, and find a special that you know is there. So you know, it's, it's a good word. But it can be passive, you can actively alter behavior. You see in store, especially if you can shop a card, buy one, get one free, all the way the card because you can get some incrementality purchase. Significant costs. It's a database. You've got to maintain that database for the world. There's two costs associated with one of the cards. One's the cost of maintaining the database and software to chunk through the data. You've got to do something with software to develop it yourself. Why? One of our businesses that blasts us was a market product called Market Expert, for that. and that is a business. Market Expert is the only software product out in the marketplace to manage free and shopping databases. So the retailers in America, whether they be Kroger, whether they be Shopping <coughs> Shop, whether it be Kmart, either develop their own software to jump to the data, or they manage and they buy the least market expert. Ralph's, one of our customers. West Coast chain, if I was familiar with LA, Ralph's, Ralph's Grocery was in 17 million cards in their database. 13 months purchase, nine terabytes worth of data. So if you're going to do a loyalty program, it costs you a significant amount of money to help maintain the ability to jump through the heads and tails. Like for Ralph's, it was not an issue. They had a chunk for that data. Okay? It rewards own users. It can get some upsell. The reason you do a loyalty program, you get big in your bucket. You're taking people that are ready in your bucket, you're getting them to buy more. It's a share of wallet issue. You want them to spend more money in, in your store. That's why you use a loyalty program. And on a short term basis, your ROI tends to be not that good, and it really depending on your tactics. The last one sends off coupons. They're very active. You've got to seek them out. You've got to cut them. You've got to find them. High involvement. You've got to handle them. Coupons, you've got to handle them. The concept in advertising is called engagement. Coupons provide engagement. I'll show you there's actually advertising value that's associated with this. One to five percent is a typical liability. But the good news here is, folks, if somebody brings a coupon into your store, you have no one motivated behavior. You can put an ROI to it, unlike a price off, unlike a rebate, hard to determine whether they motivated the purchase. This is you can tie it to purchase behavior. It's immediate gratification and the best. You generate a trial with those. If you want to buy a generate trial with your buyers in a short term coupon, that's the best tactic. And it can give you some advantages on your own life. You can buy multiple purchases, buy some, cross sell them. Good tactic, which is why it's been in existence for over 100 years. Short term ROI, 60 to 140% is generally what I see. You can get your money back in the short term on a coupon. Yeah. What you are, from a retail standpoint, defines how your coupon. This is a third party coupon, very prevalent in the grocery store. Well, you're asking the retailer or another entity to front the money to the consumer on your behalf, therefore, you've got to, you've got to get them back. You've got to get, give them a way to get the money back. Typically, the consumer business, <coughs> face value plus 10 cents for redemption. 
eight cents for Hanley goes to the retail, two cents goes to the courthouse and financial reconciliation arm, clearly and pay the retail. Third party, which most of you will be, notice the difference in design with the two types of coupons. Very, very different in design. Because you're eating it as a, as a third, as a, as a, as a self retail you're eating the financials, okay? Why do people use coupons? Nielsen has trapped consumer behavior. Nielsen has, anybody Nielsen panel member? Anybody know anybody that's a Nielsen panel member? They have 120,000 people nationally. And they come back from the grocery store, Home Depot, whatever, and scan their purchases. It goes into their database, they illustrate whether they bought it on a price discount, coupon discount, etc. Nielsen tracks these. What they found is that there is a heavy user segment with coupons in the consumer side. It's counterintuitive. You would think that people who use coupons are indigent. They're, the, they're low income people. It's exactly the opposite. High in income, presence of children, education, age. All discriminators of coupon usage. Okay? There's a heavy user segment. It's the 80 20 rule, right? 20% of the users and 80% of the coupons. When you look at the purchases in the package goods work, 65% of the coupon buying comes from this heavy user segment, 18% of the sales. So if you're, if you're a consumer business, you wonder why they do coupons? Because if you don't, you're putting 18% of your business at risk. We already know from the segmentation, there are people that are very, very influenced by coupons. I submit to you that there's an enthusiasm in each and every one of your businesses. Your challenge is to find them and figure out how to use them to your best advantage. So when you say, what's happened since 2000, it's 2008, has there been any changes? Well, if you look at coupons, look at what's happened. They track them pretty well in grocery. Coupon usage from the 90s and through 2008. I was cognizant of the order. See, 2008 changed it. If you look at what happened with coupons, in the 90s and through 2008, 240 to 250 billion coupons, like clockwork, every year they were distributing the same amount of coupons. All of a sudden, 2008 came up with the distribution of nuts. But what's really not nuts is, is redemption. Your, your redemption rates used to be about 2.4 to 2.6 million forever. I mean, absolutely forever. All of a sudden, 2008 comes up, then you're rising geometrically. 12% 12, 12 up to 3.5 billion, and the savings consumers are astronomical. It used to be anywhere from 3.2 to 3.4 billion consumers used to say year upon year. All through the 90s, all through the 80s, into the, into the early 2000s. All of a sudden, 2008 comes up, boom, big numbers. 500 billion this year, increase. 1.6 billion. The point is, guys, coupons and savings are not getting less. They're getting more. And they have translated from the consumer side to the business to business side. More and more of your customers are much more and guess what? It's not the companies that are struggling. It's the companies that are successful that are more from, more likely to be at the use. Yeah. Why do customers use coupons? Why do they use them? One, what you find statistically. Two-thirds of the redemption. Two-thirds of buyers 
B without a coupon. So it, it, the common notion used to be there's a lunatic fringe out there, and they have to have a coupon to be. What it shows you, new buyers don't necessarily need to be the coupon to be. Your, your service, your, your business, your product's performance are far more discriminators than you can. There's ad value. I mentioned the engagement. We got, we got engagement, we got the ad value. This is a study done by Knowledge Networks. Engagement of our product, of commercial decisions. They look at all four brands. What they found was there's an empirical <coughs> impact on sales that can't be explained by redemption alone. That's the ad value. Why does that occur? People look at the ad, they cut out the coupon, they forget it. They look at it, they're going to cut it out, they don't. There's an advertising effect that occurs with coupons. These four brands they looked at, 20 to 25 percent above the redemption rate was advertising value. There's one that you'll notice had no ad value. That was Kleenex. And Kleenex is a generic almost for a category. So it was a poor choice of brands as a part of promotion decision. And the last reason people generally use coupons, you know, are high potential. Again, I showed you the promotion response model with sales. This is going behavioral. This is looking at frequent shopping panels. When you look back, people redeem a coupon. What happens in a frequent shopping panel? You see them scan your coupon. You may have to see them your coupon. That coupon code is going into your, into your record. Then you go back in time and look at any new buyers. What were you buying? Is there incrementality? What this study will tell you is that the coupon incremental packages in terms of new buyers, last buyers, incremental usage, times your margin, your variable margin, divided by the cost, it was a pretty healthy ROI. Who wouldn't want to spend a buck, you get a buck 20 or a buck 40 of that in sales? Pretty good deal. Very possible. So here's my view of the landscape. Yeah? I didn't touch contests. I didn't touch sweepstakes. If you're doing those, that's a whole different discussion. You've got to question what your business objective is trying to do to your bucket. But you look at the bucket, look at the landscape. It's price offs. Jackson, new buyers, existing buyers. Problem is it's 100% financial liability. Short term ROI is 30, 40%. Where do you use it? Why grocery stores do it every year is competitive issues. Their competitors are doing what they have to do. You use it as a tiebreaker. Where you have ubiquitous items, ubiquitous businesses, it can serve as a tiebreaker. You get you the sale versus, versus one of your competitors. Three days. And it's an only user deal. Less than 1% liability. Very low ROI. But we use it for high value purchases. Where it's a low incidence purchase. We got one purchase a year, and you want to make sure that purchase goes into your bucket, not your competitors. Loyalty, long term, primarily. Short term ROIs vary. You can do a lot of things with a loyalty program because a heavy duty cost in terms of maintaining. And coupons, the best. I bring in new and lapsed users into your franchise. One to five percent to your liability. Big, big return on investment potential. And you can use it in myriad of ways. Okay? So now you might say, okay, so, so you give me a landscape. What do I need to do for the incentive program? I gotta tell you guys, this is not a capricious gesture. You don't wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna give my customers an incentive to do business with you. There's some techniques and some things to do that can help you. First thing is, what's your objective? We're trying to get new buyers. Give me a bucket. We are trying to get trying to get new buyers. You're trying to pantry them. You're trying to insulate yourself. The competitors coming into a store, build a store, build a business near you, and insulate your customers. Great way to take them out of the marketplace. Use them in the center. Increase cash register buy. Anybody get a McDonald's coupon? McDonald's just mail a whole booklet, all right? You think McDonald's makes money on a buy one, get one free on a Big Mac? Anybody think they make money on that? The answer is absolutely not. What are you trying to do? We're trying to get you to come in the store, you buy a soft drink, you buy, you buy maybe a pie, you buy some french fries, and you bring your wife and she'll get a salad, you bring your kids and they'll get something. The whole idea is to increase the incidence, get your share of wallet. That's why a franchise retail restaurant will do incentives. Not because they're making money on the incentive itself, it's because they're trying to bring you into their franchise. And last, multiple products. You want 
people to buy multiple products using some kind of incentive is one of the best ways to do it. Okay? You got to know, folks. I know it sounds obvious, but you got to know what you want to do before you, before you start on an incentive design. And I look at I look at some of the incentives I see, especially in my church bowl. My Catholic church has a bowl and then I see some of these incentives. I'm like, what the hell? What do you want to do? That doesn't Who's your target? Are you trying to get your own users? Are you store database or store records? Are you trying to target potential customers in your geography? Competitive customers. Users of complementary products. One of the easiest things that I'm surprised most of you guys don't do is you know the local coffee shop. Most of the people that you want to reach go to the coffee shop. Put them coupon. Shotguns and pickups, they, they know who the clusters are. If you go back and you look at the top clusters, translated geographically, and you know where the potential is. Called geodemographic segmentation. Pretty common. Velasquez uses a lot. Advo uses a lot. Val uh, 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 <coughs> will use it. Most of your big companies have it. Google has a targeting group right here in Ann Arbor. If you're a Google customer, Google has the group that does this stuff right in, right in Ann Arbor. A lot of glasses employees there, by the way. You can look at store potential. You can draw, look at your potential, draw a simple radius around. And then it becomes, where's the radius? What zip codes are in the radius? How do I put the appropriate media to reach those? The point is, guys, is you can get as sophisticated as you want on targeting, or you can get as simple as you want. You know they go down the street and get a coffee house, put some coupons in the coffee house, put a price flyer in the, in the, in the coffee shop. Pick the right media, guys. I'm telling you, there are an infinite choice of media. The more you know, 
know about your target. Who am I trying to reach? Easier it makes to distribute it in the right manner. I mean, Groupon, Facebook's doing it, newspapers. You know, you get, you get some reaching, but I got hometown, hometown connection. It's, it's in Plymouth. There's tons of offers, full of offers. Dr. Sinatra is saying you something, buy three, get one free. You got tons of offers sitting in here. The ad will pick the red corners that comes in the red box. There's tons of ways to get incentives out. I told you, I go to my church. My church board has, has incentives from local businesses. I mean, they're everywhere. You've got an infinite myriad of possibilities. Your key is why do you want to reach them and who do you want to reach and how do you make the right media choice? Create affordable value proposition. You might say, if I want to get trial, I want to put new buyers into my franchise. What's the magic? Research will tell you 30 to 40% of your face out, trial and sandwich. That's the magic under that works. <clears throat> Only users, 15 to 20 percent. And remember, you couldn't have the out there 30 to 40 percent. I don't know why it's going to take advantage of The only people that are going to take advantage of it are the people that are motivated by the incentive if you're doing it right. Track it. You yeah, want to evaluate the ROI, you want to know what media is pulling the right people for you, where they're coming from, where the things are coming from. The tracking mechanism in place. And financial prudence is always the case. It, it, this is not something that you got to spend a million bucks to do what it's saying. You can do it as small as you want. What it is, is the test, test, test mentality. Go to something test small. See if it works. Learn from it. Alter it. And something different. It's a process to get you in a position that, that's, that's, better, that's better than you can do in competitors. Competitive. Competitive. Some of you are saying, well, no, nobody in space does any kind of the right? Why would I want to do that? And what research will tell you. The first one in, the marketplace will reward innovation. You're the first one to do a particularly innovative incentive program to drive results. If your competitors follow you, they will take the marketplace with disproportionately the one you want to throw. Design for success. Is there any creatives here? <coughs> okay, some creatives here. Third party design, you gotta have expiration date and, and that offer. Pretty clear. You need some legal copy to fit the teller, tell the guy, but the retailer will learn to send it, and you need a tracking mechanism. Self-liquidating, same thing. Clear offer, location, expiration date. I used to manage creative groups. Chris and Myers, IMF, Lysol, and in Velasquez. I used to spend a lot of money with outside agencies pretty creative together for our promotion programs. I can't tell you the number of times but I looked at creative and scratched my head. It is, you know, oh, I want to make mine look different. Huh? And, and, and I used to always use this, this concept, I used to call the Lyle test. And Lyle was the simplest salesperson in our organization. He was the dumbest mud. And so the Lyle test was, if Lyle can understand what you're, what you're offering, everyone in North America can. So I would encourage creatives, and if you're doing programs for your customers, here's the Lyle Fest. It'll work great for you. Tracking. When you're doing consumer stuff, you'll see these on your coupon. You see, you know, UPC bar oriented stuff. Off the UPC bar, they're moving to what they call GS1 bar. They're a huge program. That's for the clearinghouse. That's count the coupons and clear them for some, some data that's in there. You probably won't do that. And what you do have, you get the QSR codes. Put a QSR code on. Put in what media, what time frame, who it went to. There's a lot of data you can put in a QSR code on which you get the coupon back. Because you remember, you're going to get it back. If you save it, you can, you can scan it and look at the data. You can learn a lot about That's part of the test, retest mentality. And the owners do something that's sophisticated. Use your own code. <laughs> if it runs around, it doesn't matter. You can do that. As long as you know what the number means, it's, it's familiar. So as you go forward, 
If you look at your bucket and you say, oh man, in 2012, I got, to, I got trouble in River City, rhymes with Pierre, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you say, how do I, how can I impact my customer? Okay. One, you know your objective, guys. Think of your bucket. It's a pretty simple mechanism, but if you think of your business with a buy as a bucket, you'll be right more times than that. Know your target. The more you know about them, the better off you are because you'll be able to use the appropriate media. <coughs> Create a value proposition that's consistent with your objective. You want to try 30, 40 percent? You want to load your own users? One, 15, 20 percent. Buy one, get one phrase I would use with great trepidation because they're financially very, very. I like Dr. Dr. Sinatra's buy three, get one free. I mean, at least you can amortize the cost of the three and over minimal purchases. Okay? Wild test. If you can't understand it, I can assure you your customers won't. You track results. Test, test, test. You don't have to do incentive marketing on a broad scale basis. You can do it very, very easily. Okay? I'm going to submit to you that every one of your businesses has these discussions. And the question is, are you telling any kind of financial incentives or incentive marketing techniques into the next three business? Can you use some of the best practices we've talked about? Think about planning. Try to do the best you can for your business. Start small and move forward. You'll be more likely to want. So, Hopefully today I got out the bucket. Hopefully you'll take away the bucket. Beth still remembers the bucket, right Beth? I do, yeah. Uh, how you can use incentives to fail that bucket and to try to take it out. And remember one thing, from my perspective, I've been around the block once or twice. I've done every one of the incentives I talked about today, I've done. It's one thing I've learned. Any questions? Gary, thank you so much for a very informative presentation. Would everybody please put their hands together for Gary Rose? <laughs> Gary, I particularly liked the little graph that you did um, summarizing the different types of incentives and the degree of ROI and the time periods. I think that was a really useful summary. That was a late edition. How do I make this? That's a good one. So do we have some questions for Gary on incentives and promotions? Monty? Um, um, so you mentioned there's a lot of different media. Do you have, have you seen anything that shows how once the different media came in, things segmented like people were using Groupon more or going in? Just for the record, I'm not going to uh, oh, okay, but I mean, but, but still, well, let me, let me people are putting things out electronically and through email, so did that shift things at all, or did people just use more of everything? Well, first let me go to Groupon, and you'll get attached to Groupon. Groupon, the way it works, you get an incentive. It's a fairly big incentive. It's 50% or so. You split the revenue you get off the thing with Groupon. Okay. Who takes advantage of this? Think of the segmentation. You think Groupon is going to take advantage of that? It's a limited fringe. So your VP off Groupon, my suspicion would be very, very small. And when Groupon came to blast it, I, part of my responsibility is looking at new business ventures and everybody wanted to blast his money in Salesforce. <laughs> That's what they wanted. And Groupon came to us and we rejected it because I just don't have a sense that this is going to work. There's two questions specifically. There's no magic. I mean, what it comes down to, what are you trying to do? What are your metrics for well, well, what I mean, though, is, like, let's say a big company that has, that's been doing a lot of coupons, and then they start doing electronically, are there any studies that show how it has impacted their m merchandising? Uh, not, not per se, but, but what I will tell you is that moving electronically, if you're doing coupons in a broad-scale manner and you move electronically, Problems by just sheer numbers. 90% of the coupon redemption consumers face are redeemed from the Sunday newspaper. 
the Sunday newspaper coupons. If you go to electronic, your volume is going to suffer. And again, the, the landscape is littered with people in the package goods world. P&G, many years ago, did their famous no coupon fest in upstate New York. They bowed with you, and their goal is pretty simple. If they can talk their competitors into not doing coupons, the doctor had the brands and the advertising, they win. Well, unfortunately for them, nobody followed them. Instead, they redoubled their efforts on couponing in Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse, New York, and P&G got killed. The market share is plummeting, et cetera. So there is incidents that if you alter your tactics, remember one important thing. I used to tell people this all my customers and my staff. You got X amount of, of, of revenue that's being generated from your current spend. So you change tactics. The first hurdle for that change in tactics, you've got to cover what you already got. And what you already got is going away. And, and when people used to cut kill coupons, and every one of the packages, the new leader at Colgate, the Proctor, they all trying to kill coupons at one point in time. And what they found is what they replaced it with didn't generate the same revenue in their volume of stuff. So it, again, you, you got to be careful. But for you guys, this brave new world for B2B guys, that there is no, there is no new normal. You guys are creating a new normal in terms of incentive behavior. You can train your customers how to buy and what's 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 the normal. Yeah. What do you think of J.C. Penney's new strategy? Uh, what are my segmentation chart? Twenty-five percent of people are on price. They're yeah. really appeal to those guys. Everybody else that needs sales and needs to sell. I don't know. I think it's a bold move. One born out of desperation as opposed to practical business realities. And I, again, I, I'd be interested to see what our my suspicion is about that. And I'm serious for Kmart's price. Yeah, my, my, my suspicion is about that. Food Line was, a, was the first EDLP manufacturer of grocery retailer in everyday world class. Walmart tries to. A Walmart does it. As a manufacturer calling them Walmart, it ain't your day. You turn the upside down and shake every dime you can out of it. And so Walmart flees you out of this kind of Their prices are always lower than everybody else's. And the are different. But Food Line found that their EDLP strategy, when they first did it, life was good. Then everybody started to get together with the price, the coupons, et cetera, and, and they had to alter their tactics. <laughs> kind of two situations. Really, really changed things. So, yeah, question uh, do we have a question out to your right here? Uh, yeah. You can ask your right one. I can do it. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, what? Oh, uh, yeah, my question was, um, you mentioned a couple times uh, that a lot of folks here are PUB. I, I know we are, and our business is basically professional services. So, um, I guess the question I have is, in the position that we're in, um, if you're putting some kind of incentive-based program out there, how do you do that without that negatively impacting the brand? I know I'm trying to convince people that I'm worth X number of dollars an hour, and that my staff is worth a certain amount. I was working for that. Well, I guess I don't know. I, what I'm saying is, because I'm not just selling some of the product and I'm going to walk away with that, I have to deal with the client. And actually, the last client I want is the bargain hunting client who's going to heckle and nickel and dime and try and work every last penny they can out of because I have to with them for months. Well, so same, same thing you got you got to test yourself for one, that nickel and dime customer. In your current strategy you never do get. So first thing you gotta decide is is a purchase occasion for one of those people valuable to you yourself that you're gonna have to pay for it. Second thing is is that is that yeah I told you that you said this especially two points, two thirds of the people who keep it out of two it doesn't necessarily erode your brand of worth. I mean, there's a the next part of that study that I showed you the 33,000 consumers, because that's a common now. See, I used to sit with CEOs and from the package good side all the time. And lower my lower my brand of worth. What you found, you have to follow that same group for three years. And what you found is that the share of requirements, that's the CPG version of brand worth, how much share of an individual category am I satisfied with my brand? Your loyalty quotient defined by sharing the price was exactly the same. So it, it, intellectually, it said I'm going to erode my business. Practically, I don't think it does. I've seen nothing that would suggest it does. The key for you is who are you not getting today? 
You're not getting people into the franchise for a reason. Can an incentive program geometrically expand your user base so it's bring in you use the right incentive, you don't have to do it for everybody. So you're not jeopardizing what you're going to Can you please give a concrete example of a service organization? I'm going to have to, to uh, oh, ask sure. you to, to cut. Um, we've got lots more questions, and we could carry on this conversation for quite a while. Gary will be here um, afterwards to, you know, so please come up and ask your questions. Another round of applause for Gary. Um, it's now time to pass the mic. We have a quick 10 minutes to go around the room. Um, if you haven't been to LA2M before, we would like you to stand up, introduce yourself, um, a, a few words about who you are and what you do or what you want. We'll start off with Karen. Hi, Karen Hesselberg. Uh, if I can help you with health <coughs> questions or any online for small merchants, let us know. Hi, Jane Galancy. Uh, Galancy Design, and basically we are graphic designers for marketing for small businesses and individuals. Um, we make you look good and provide great results. Mark Reynolds, uh, Growth Biz Sales. We do sales process development for mid-sized companies. And I brought a guy along with me. This is James Harrison. I'll let him speak for himself. Hi, as Mark said, my name is uh, James Harrison. And, uh, I have experience in uh, uh, brand management, and marketing, and advertising, primarily with uh, IMG, and I'm here uh, looking to uh, leverage that to see if there's any opportunities to develop the uh, greater Ann Arbor and Detroit areas. My name is Gregory Gentle. <coughs> my first time to uh, this function. I really enjoyed it. I represent Spring Arbor University. How many of you have heard of Spring Arbor University? Here in Jackson, Michigan, we're a Christian large university. We're raising our profile in the Ann Arbor area, and we offer uh, undergraduate and graduate uh, degrees for uh, non-traditional working adult students. Uh, my name is Eric Lynch. Uh, I'm with uh, Build Create Studios. We're uh, design, branding, and websites and web presence building. Um, and uh, our goal for our customers is to take a website from something that's an overhead expense or something that's uh, Mike went with Sandler Training, where we help uh, entrepreneurs, small business owners sell more and sell more easily. Right now, I've got a client in the Washington County area that's uh, looking to hire a sales manager, marketing manager type. So, if you're looking, uh, let me know. If you have the best time. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fred Blanche with uh, Zenicomp. We are a Microsoft technology firm dealing in uh, managed network services, managing computer networks from 15 PCs up to 75 PCs. Fred Blanche with Zenicomp. Hi, I'm Lindsay Jusek. I'm the two-day workshop at Mini Conference, well, where you'll learn to create and manage and market a website that you built yourself. You can learn more at create your WD. Hello, I'm Ross Johnson with 3.7 Designs, uh, which is a design, branding, and marketing company. Um, we're also releasing an iPhone app shortly that will help those of you who uh, lease cars save some money. And it was developed by uh, Tom Crawford here, and he did an amazing job, so if you need some uh, mobile help, I would talk to him. Uh, yes, I am Tom Crawford, thanks for us. Um, and if you want to see a demo of the app, come by. I've got it on my phone. You can check it out, so if you've got a lease paper, we'll try it. But uh, today I'm not talking about mobile app development. Today I want to let you know I'm running a workshop on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. So if you want to learn how to communicate better, we're bringing in some people from all over the country who are the best in their category. So we've got uh, Cliff Atkinson, who has written many books and presents on presentation skills design. We have uh, Jamie Nast on mind mapping. We have um, uh, Carl Goode, who is the former graphics director for Newsweek and the Associated Press. So a great group if you want to learn how to communicate better. It's only 100 bucks. You can't get that deal anywhere else in the country. So uh, it's in Waterford, March 17th. Uh, visit literacy.com, by the way. As a former employer, I'm expecting you some sentences to get people If you come see me, I'll... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so visit literacy.com. V-I-C literacy.com. 
Well, good afternoon, Dr. Thomas Blackwell, a proud alumni of Spring Arbor. Uh, I'm also the principal owner of uh, Impel Motivation and Training Development Company. Hey, everybody. I'm Casey Peters with Dexter Builders, a residential design firm. Um, you guessed it, Dexter. Um, might go a little bit over my time, but uh, next Tuesday we're doing an open house with uh, Ferguson Plumbing at their uh, bath and light, bath and kitchen gallery, yeah, sorry, on uh, Jackson Road, almost all the way out to Z. Um, I'll start with the good part. There's going to be food and beer, one. Um, there will also be design teams if you have you know, a kitchen or bathroom project you'd like to get a little head start on. Um, feel free to stop by. Again, that's next Tuesday, 5 to 8 at uh, Ferguson. <coughs> Hi, Susan Harris, technical writer, focus on internet engineering. I'm Chuck Newman. I'm here today on behalf of Sticker It, a company dedicated to increasing gift sales, whether online or in brick and mortar, by facilitating the attachment of a personalized recorded message that goes with whatever is purchased. Hi, I'm Joel Bergen with Dish Fish. Dish Fish dollars are a dollar off fundraising coupons that bring customers to local retailers and raise funds for community organizations. They'll be available in Washtenaw County soon. If your business or organization would like to participate, give me your business card or go to dishfish.com. Hi, my name is Dan Blackwood. I'm a recent grad from Michigan State University, and I currently work for Indian Digital Market. Hi, I'm Brent Rosentrader. Uh, I'm currently a student at the University of Michigan down the road, and I'm an intern at Nginx right now. Hi, I'm Claire Hughes. I'm a marketing communications and fundraising consultant, and I have a background in education, healthcare, and small business development. Hi, my name is Greg Boyle. I work with Bloom Roofing Systems, and we offer commercial roof replacement and repair services. So if your roof is leaking, uh, give me a call. Hi everybody, I'm Jim Musial and with uh, excuse me, Knology Digital. We are a web and mobile technology company located right here in downtown Ann Arbor. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Larry Polkoff and I'm with my own company, uh, Associates, uh, marketing business development. Uh, actually right now I'm looking for a full-time position. And uh, uh, I'm Hi, my name is Brad Fritz. I'm a recent grad of Google and I'm currently an online marketing intern at Stone Interactive Group right up the street on Liberty, which is a SEO firm for all those of you who probably haven't heard of it because it's pretty small. Hi, I'm Dennis Skupinski. I'm in sales and marketing and I'm assisting with video today. Uh, I'm Roger Rail, and uh, magically we have the camera working by itself. <laughs> I'm Bud Gibson. I started the search marketing program at Eastern Michigan University. I really liked Gary's presentation. Um, search marketing, and you hit it the essence. It's really about segmenting your customers and then understanding what it is you need to offer those customer segments and whether the promotion is actually worth it to you. Hi, I'm Lisa Radwick, and I'm a marketing professional with experience in consumer um, goods as well as business to business and as well as And I'm uh, Jim Campbell from excitingproductions.com. And uh, people seek us out when they are worrying that uh, people coming to their website are bouncing off uh, to a competitor's website. We produce engaging videos uh, that build trust in what you do. I invite you to look at our portfolio and testimonials online at excitementproductions.com. I'm Cliff Shelton with Ann Arbor State Bank, uh, also with uh, Ann Arbor Score that provides um, free counseling for uh, new businesses. I'm Monty Fowler, and one of the things I'm willing to admit to in public is I create WordPress sites. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jane Pacheco, and I am here today on behalf of uh, Edgar Norman Creative out of Chelsea. It's a professional ad agency that has recently launched a small de department, I guess, called Egg, and we focus on helping small mom and pops that are in the food business. I also uh, operate an online farmer's market down the road called Dunasa. Hi, Beth Heist. I do sales and marketing for Sun Towels, and I also teach at Adrian College in their business department. 
Uh, my name is Gil Stanford. My company is Stanford Enterprises. And what I do is I help homeowners improve the quality of their living environment by using a creative design build approach for home improvement. So I solve problems and fix houses. Hi, I'm Curtis Sherman from Prince Studios, and I'm a commercial editorial and portrait photographer, sometimes video editor. Gary, any closing words? Closing words? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, be here, I'll be here to answer any questions you have. That, you know, I, I come routinely, if we don't catch up today, I'll be here in the next couple of weeks so we can mm. catch up on. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Gary. I'm Dee Davy, Creative Ideas Marketing. And I help companies who provide business-to-business -business services when they want to grow their business and they're not sure what to do. Do they need creative ideas for me? I wear a second hat, and that is I'm a knight of the marketing roundtable. Marketing roundtable um, is run by Spark and meets every second Tuesday of the month. And in March 13th, I would like you to put this in your calendars because I'm leading a panel discussion on customer experience. Uh, we've got a great panel of experts lined up um, who are going to come in and show you how to um, grow your sales and build your business using customer service as the cornerstone for improving sales and improving your bottom line. So a date for your calendar is March 13th over at Spark Marketing Roundtable, 5 to 7 p.m. The third hat that I wear is that of the voice of Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing. Um, I work with Derek and a lot of the other um, volunteers to get the word out about um, LA2M. And it's my pleasure to introduce next week's speaker. We have Lindsay Blackwell, um, a bright young spark in Ann Arbor. And she's going to show you how using your personal brand and interactive content um, <coughs> through social media can make your resume, whether it's business or personal, really stand out. So we'll see you next week at LA2M. Thanks again to Gary. Gary wanted a song, but I'm sorry, I'm going to say. See you next week. Thank you. Uh, no, I haven't uh, played the whole lot of the year.